Good morning, Grace family. Uh, You have made it through another week. Uh, By my count, as we uh, enter into this weekend or tomorrow when we begin the week, this will be week eight. I hope that wherever you are, that you are doing well. I hope that uh, anyone uh, in your life and people that you care about are well. And also, we know uh, others in our own congregation who are dealing with illness, and uh, we remember all of them prayerfully. We've been talking about disruptions, and Marnie started that series last week. I don't think I have to work too hard to tell you why that word is uh, significant for the season, the time that we've been living in. Every single one of us, in some way, has experienced a disruption. Plans have been disrupted, graduations have been disrupted, jobs have been disrupted, health has been disrupted, and even now as we look to the summer, there's still uncertainty about what summer will look like. Travel plans have been disrupted. It's probably not really a surprise to us that life can be turned upside down at any given moment. We knew that well before the coronavirus was a reality in our world. Some of you at some point already know what it means to experience a disruption in your life. And the fact that our lives can be disrupted is really not a surprise to us. We've probably never felt it quite as we're feeling it these days. But again, it's just not a surprise. What we struggle with, and probably what is a surprise to us, and that uh, we struggle to understand, is the way that dealing with God, as we deal with God and as God deals with us, we discover that God is, in some ways, disruptive of our lives. All through the Bible, God seems to show up and disrupt the lives of the people that we're seeing in this story. If we go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible and look at Abraham, here's a 75-year-old man. He's well settled in a land that he knows very well, that his family has been in all of his life. And God invites him, commands him, calls him to leave his place and to leave his people and to go to a land that the Lord will show him, an undetermined place. That's disruptive. If we move a little further into the Bible and we come up on Moses, even from his youngest days as an infant, he's taken from the arms of his mother. He's raised in the courts of Pharaoh. As he grows up, he's forced to run away to flee to the desert of Midian, where he spends time as a shepherd. And then in the desert of Midian, God encounters him in a burning bush and calls him back to Egypt. That's disruptive. There's a moment when the prophet Elijah is told to find and to anoint his successor, his younger protege, Elisha. And he finds Elisha plowing a field with a team of oxen and a plow He calls Elisha into this new life, and Elisha burns his plows. That was a change. That was disruptive. We get into the New Testament. Peter and Andrew, James and John are fishermen. Jesus calls them, and we're told that they left their nets. They left their father in the boat, James and John did. They left a family business to follow Jesus. That's disruptive. And then there's the Pharisee Paul, zealous for the law of God, an intensely devout man 
who is harassing and hunting those who are followers of Jesus. And on his way to Damascus, Paul encounters the resurrected, the resurrected, the risen Christ. And Jesus calls him to be numbered among those whom he despised, whom he was hunting and harassing. Paul becomes a follower of Jesus. And that's disruptive. All throughout the Bible, we see that our God is a disruptive God. And today we're going to see that in the story, probably one of the best known stories of the Old Testament, the story of Jonah. This is one of those Bible stories that I feel like I cannot remember a time when I haven't known it. We teach it to our children in their Sunday school classes, but there are so many things about it, it is not really a children's story. When you think of the story of Jonah, probably one of the first things you think of is the big fish, what I learned and always called the whale. But the Bible doesn't call it a whale. Still, it occupies kind of a centerpiece in our imaginations in the story of Jonah. We're going to look at that character today, and as we get ready to read the story, I want to ask you to think about a question. One of the things uh, our family has done during these quarantine days, every now and then, is we'll get out for a walk. We don't always get to do it together, but one day we got out, all four of us walking together. I was already thinking a little bit about the story of Jonah, so I asked, uh, asked my family, what would you say is the great disruptive moment in the story of Jonah? So I want to throw that question out to you. As best you know the story, as you think about it, what would you say is the great disruptive moment in the story of Jonah? And in fact, if you're able to respond in a dialogue box, however you may be following this service, I'd love to know your answer. The great disruptive moment in the story. I'm going to read part of chapter 1. And I want you to look or listen for what your answer to that question might be. We're in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Here's the very familiar story. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break apart. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God, perhaps the God will give us a thought that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. We skip down, we follow the story, and we come to this part where they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know that it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. And then just a few moments later in the story, we read that they picked up Jonah. This is the end of the chapter at verse 15. They picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, 
and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Okay, so back to the question. What would you identify as the great disruptive moment in the story of Jonah? When we were out walking, there were two answers that came up. The first one seemed pretty obvious. The first answer that came up is that the great disruptive moment in this story is in the storm. God sends a storm, the sea is raging, and God is is looking to bring Jonah into obedience to what he has called him to do. But we also noted that probably the greatest disruptive moment is not the storm, but it's the very first line of the story. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh. God called Jonah to do something that he didn't want to do. You could look through all of this short little story. It's only four chapters long, and you could probably find a number of places that we would say are disruptive moments in the story. But at the very beginning, we see these two, and they tell us something about all of our disruptions. They tell us something about ourselves, and they tell us something about God. Every disruption we live through tells us something about who we are, and every disruption we live through tells us something about who God is. And this morning I want to invite you just to think with me today about what the disruption that we're living through might be telling us. And we get some help from that as we look at the story of Jonah. The story begins and we do see that this disruption tells us something about Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, Arise, go, and call out against the city of Nineveh. And those two verbs, arise and go, are pretty important because in the very next verse, Jonah does two of those things. He gets up and he goes, but he goes in a different direction. This disruption is calling Jonah to a place that he does not want to go. And it reveals to us that Jonah has some resistance, not simply to being obedient to God, Jonah has a problem with going to Nineveh. He does not want to go to that place. He does not want to be a prophet among those people. In fact, Jonah readily calls himself a prophet of God. In fact, if we had read the entire story down around verse 10, where they ask him who you are. Jonah says, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. But Jonah does not want to go to Nineveh. Very often the disruptions that we go through reveal and expose something in our own heart. In fact, this story, one of the most interesting things about it is that we get to the very end and we might think that by the end of the story, Jonah's heart has changed, that maybe God has been able to bring Jonah to a different place. But Jonah has gone to Nineveh. He has done what God asked him to do. And at the very end of the story, Jonah is still angry. And that's how the story ends. We simply see him as an angry prophet. He is angry because of the mercy and the grace that God showed to Nineveh. And that disruption has revealed something in his own heart. 
I think sometimes our disruptions reveal something about us in the same way. Sometimes disruptions can reveal things that are very noble and good, and we have seen that in these days. This disruption has revealed that we are capable of caring about our neighbors. In the lives of first responders and doctors and nurses, this disruption has revealed a capacity for heroism and for service and for taking risks. But I also know that in my own life, this disruption has revealed the things that I really look to to help me know that I am okay and that life is good. Some things have been taken away. I've not been in control of things that I want to do. Things that I had looked forward to have changed. And there have been moments, I don't know if you've felt it, but there have been moments when this disruption has made me a little bit like Jonah. I have been an angry preacher. I've been grieved. And this disruption has exposed in some ways my own heart. It has shown me some of the lesser gods that I cling to for a sense of well-being, maybe for a sense of security and safety, Disruptions have a way of revealing things about us. And I don't know if in these days, in this disruption, that you have found yourself every day dealing with some kind of worry. Maybe you've dealt with some kind of resentment. Maybe you've dealt with some kind of anger. Disruptions have a way of showing us what's in our heart, both the things that are noble and good and the things that we need to repent of. But disruptions, perhaps most importantly, they don't only tell us something about ourselves, they tell us something about God. In fact, uh, Jen Wilkin, who's a Bible teacher in Dallas, Texas, has written a book about Bible reading and Bible study. And one of the things that she said at the beginning of her book is that the most important question we can ever ask when we read the Bible is simply, what does this tell us about God? Far too often we look for ourselves in the story before we look for what this is telling us about God. And our disruptions reveal something about the God who created us and loves us. As Jonah runs, we are told twice that the thing he is seeking to flee is the presence of the Lord. That phrase shows up two times in verse 3. Jonah rose to flee from the presence of the Lord. He went down and got on a boat, and then the phrase comes up again, away from the presence of the Lord And then in verse 4, but the Lord hurled a great wind, a storm. God is in pursuit of the prophet. God is in pursuit of his people. And very often the storm that you are living through, the storm you may be in today, is not an act of punishment. In the story of Jonah, when God hurls this storm, he does not do this to punish Jonah. He is not seeking to punish him for an act of disobedience. When God hurls a great wind on the sea, God is not punishing He is pursuing. He is going after. And his aim is to go after Jonah and to bring him into who he was called to be. His aim is to bring him back to himself. In our disruptions, very often, God is pursuing us. He is inviting us to a place 
bringing us back to himself, bringing us to the people that we were called to be. Eugene Peterson notes that it is not until the second chapter of the book that Jonah finally speaks to God. In fact, if you heard Marnie's Wednesday word this past week, she read Jonah's prayer. Throughout chapter 1, Jonah has not once addressed God. God has spoken to Jonah. Jonah has spoken to the sailors. The sailors have spoken to Jonah, but Jonah has never spoken to God until he finds himself in the belly of the fish. Eugene Peterson notes, this is the place, and it's a difficult place, but it is in this place and this moment that Jonah finally deals with God. And that's what God is after. He's He wants to bring us back to himself. I love what Eugene Peterson wrote. He said, The belly of a fish is a place of confinement, a tight, restricted place. The belly of a fish was the unattractive opposite to everything Jonah had set out for. The belly of a fish was a dark, dank, disgusting cell, but it was where Jonah's life was turned around, and it's often where our lives are turned around too. What we want is a five-star hotel by the sea with a room with a view overlooking it. In the hotel, we can call anyone we want for assistance. The maid, the manager, the front desk, room service... But in the belly of the fish, there's only one call to make, and that is to God. Our disruptions reveal a God who pursues us, even in the most difficult circumstances. A God who pursues us and seeks to bring us back to himself. And the clearest way that God did that was in sending his son, Jesus. Jesus was God's coming to us. And in going to his death, Jesus entered into the darkest kind of storm. And as we come to him and as we look to him, we find our way through As we started last week with the 23rd Psalm, we find our way through the valley of the shadow of death, through the storm. We turn around and we deal with God. And maybe today God is pursuing you. I don't know if there's a way that you've been running, resisting. I don't know what this disruption has revealed about your own heart. But the God who created you today is pursuing you and seeking you and calling you back to himself. He waits for you to turn and to come to him. And we can do that even in the midst of our disruptions. Let's go to God together and pray. God, we're so grateful that you are a God who pursues us. We're thankful that even in the most difficult disruptions, you call us back to yourself. And we pray that in these days, we pray that in the midst of what we are living through now, we would turn to you, that we would deal with you, And Father, we're thankful that when we do, we find your grace and your mercy made available to us in your Son, Jesus. And we offer our prayer today in his name. Amen.